Hello, and welcome to Baltic Ways, a podcast bringing you interviews and insights from the world of Baltic studies. I'm your host, Dr. Indra Ekbis. Today, we're speaking with Dr. Marek Dam, a professor of cultural history at Tallinn University and the head of the Center of Excellence in Intercultural Studies. We're speaking with Dr. Tam about his wide range of interests, from how cultural memory has shaped Estonia as a nation and partner, to how we might gamify Livonia's cultural heritage, and all the way into the future of history, interspecies and interplanetary history, and why he thinks historians should rethink the concept of linear time. Stay tuned. Dr. Tom, it's uh, so nice to have you on on Baltic Ways. Thank you for joining me. Perhaps we could start and you can tell us just a bit about yourself and your work. Yeah, thank you for having me in your podcast. I was born and raised in Tallinn, in Estonia, mm-hmm. and I studied uh, history and semiotics at the University of Tartu in the uh, mid-90s, and then moved to Paris to continue with my MA studies at the Ecole des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, uh, in medieval studies more specifically. And then I earned my PhD degree from Tallinn University with a dissertation on um, medieval representations of the Baltic Sea area. And ever since I've been working at the University of Tallinn, I am currently a full professor of cultural history at the School of Humanities of Tallinn University. I also am head of the Center of Excellence in Intercultural Studies and was elected last year to the Estonian Academy of Sciences. And I have a quite a great variety of research interests. As I mentioned, I was formed as a medievalist and medieval studies is still one of, of my main research for key, especially in the medieval history of, of Livonia, of current days, Latvia and Estonia. Uh, but I've also been from the beginning interested in theoretical and methodological questions of historical research. So I developed an interest in theory and methodology of history. And I mentioned also that I studied semiotics at the University of Tartu, and I still have strong interest in, in semiotics and in particular in tradition of Tartu Moscow School of Semiotics, meaning the work of Yuri Lotman and, and of cultural semiotics. So I've tried to elaborate something I call the uh, semiotics of history. And also another field of interest for me has been the cultural memory studies and the discussion of of relations between history and memory. And now for the last decade or so, I'm also being involved in digital humanities and the digital history uh, more specifically. So these are my main, let's say, fields of interest. And I have to admit, I never conceived myself as a as a scholar of Baltic uh, studies. But I have to admit that a lot of my research actually is geographically located within the Baltic area, uh, in the sense of of Estonia and Latvia, but also in the sense of of the Baltic Sea region as such. So that's for a brief introduction. Well, great. You mentioned your interest in in cultural history, so maybe maybe we can start there as an entrance um, into the Baltic Sea region space too. Uh, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your work on Estonia and how the Estonian cultural memory has been shaped. Yeah, I make by the way a difference between cultural history uh, and and the study of cultural memory. And cultural memory is an important part of of cultural history. Uh, in terms of, of my research, uh, yes, I've been interested in uh, exploring the, the importance of cultural memory in Estonian nation building. Uh, what do Estonians remember of the past? What they do prefer to remember? What they prefer to forget? What are the main sort of motives or themes in Estonian memory? And one of my... Uh, arguments have been that the Estonian national identity is built on the narrative template I call fight for freedom. And this narrative is structuring uh, most of the Estonian culture memory since the 
uh, early medieval times. We have been a constant fight for freedom, for independence. And, and of course, historically speaking, it's not very accurate, right? On the level of, of historical memory, it works very well. And I think it's not that different for an instance of Latvian uh, cultural memory, this idea of a small nation fighting for the freedom against the foreign uh, forces. And also I've been interested in the role of literature in Estonian culture memory. What role have played the major historical uh, novels in, in constructing the Estonian historical memory? And my argument is that actually novelists have had a great impact on the way you remember Estonian past than historians. Quite often historians follow the general let's say, patterns uh, established by a novelist, for instance, emphasizing the importance of this or that historical event or this or that historical person. Um, so I believe indeed that it is important in order to understand Estonian society today, and even Estonian foreign policy or Estonian relations with other countries, it's important to understand uh, what Estonians uh, make consider important of the past, what kind of historical traumas are still, you know, vivid and, and important. And for instance, the fact that Estonia is, is kind of desperately uh, uh, looking for, for friends, for allies, uh, for being as connected with the rest of the world as possible is, is very much shaped by this historical uh, experience, though, or the mnemonic experience of of being alone in face of, of some foreign invasions or foreign enemies. So that's briefly my interest in, in the cultural memory of, of Estonia. Yeah, you, you bring it briefly into this kind of contemporary aspect as well. And I wonder how you see that history shaping Estonia's response and reaction to this moment in, in time, especially around the war in Ukraine, which seems to have some parallels too. Yeah, definitely, uh, the Estonians' behavior in the in this recent um, Ukrainian war is deeply shaped by our historical experience, but not only historical experience again, but also by these kind of ways of remembering, especially in terms of the 20th, 20th century experiences. These experiences are, are very much uh, traumatic related to different occupations and this experience of, of being alone being uh, without any help and without any allies. And I think in the Ukrainian case, um, we want to compensate in, in, in a way this, this experience of being alone and we want to be a close ally to Ukraine to, to provide our help. But also because we, of, we understand that being the member of, of a great uh, geopolitical power like Russia, it is critical uh, to be very cooperative with other uh, neighboring countries and, and, and to form a sort of unified uh, counter power to the geopolitical ambitions of, of, of the big neighbor. Yeah, absolutely. You also talk a little bit about the digitalization of historical culture and of heritage, digitalization of heritage. And I'm, I'm interested uh, to hear a little bit more about that, especially with the you know, Estonia having this moniker of the E-Estonia and this digital native nation. Yes, I believe that this recent uh, emergence of the new digital condition, as I would call it, has a major impact on our, on our notion of history, on our relations with, uh, with the past. And, and my central argument is that our relations with the past are increasingly digitally mediated meaning that we learn from the past via different digital forms of, of, of history writing or of historical culture. And I think this is a great challenge uh, because history uh, over the last couple of centuries has been mostly historiography, meaning it has been written. It exists in, in the form of, of texts and article books, but also in in the form of oral text, in lectures and, and talks and, and radio sh shows, etc. But now we are witnessing this digitization of our relations uh, with the past, of course, in the form of, of, of films and, and, and digital uh, photos, but increasingly also in the form of, of digital 
history games. And, and I can see already from my encounter with my students that we have a new generation who has a different relationship with the past because it is much more immersive, much more sort of intense, uh, much more even emotional, affective, because um, these digital mediations of the past appeal to different, you know, senses and, and are more, much more interactive than our traditional forms of historical mediation in the, in the forms of texts, for instance. So this is, yeah, my recent interest to explore what happens uh, with the history, with our notion of history, with historical representations at the time of this new digital condition. And uh, yeah, we're trying to analyze from historians' perspective the role of, of these digital games and to what extent we have to, you know, introduce these new digital techniques into historical scholarship and into history teaching. But then, then of course, uh, my second interest in, in relation to this topic is, is more, more specific, more traditional. I also believe that this digitization shapes our access to sources and provides us new analytical tools, how to interpret these sources. So for instance, I'm currently running a, a five years research project funded by Estonian Research Council called Digital Livonia for an enhanced or a digitally enhanced study of medieval Livonia. And, and the project has two main aims. On the one hand, we want to make digitally available as many sources about Livonian history as possible, meaning digitizing, you know, different medieval manuscripts and books and, and other forms of, of, of information. Uh, but then on the other hand, we want also to do, apply new tools, new analytic tools to make sense of this digitized data implement different uh, network uh, and study tools and also different tools of visualization and etc so i believe that also in terms of practical historical research we are witnessing major transformations major changes and and i believe that also history as a field of research will change uh, quite dramatically in the coming decades uh, so these are, yes, my, let's say, two main interests in this particular field. Yeah, it strikes me that this digitalization of history or heritage and how how we interact both as as researchers but also as the public is is quite interesting, right? This gamification, right, of 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 history opens it up in in Broadway to to people who might not be willing to sit in a library and, you know, page through a large text. In this digital Livonia, what, what are some of the, perhaps products is not the right word, but outputs of, of that? Yeah, it's, it's still on its early phase, but we will hope to launch uh, very soon, let's say in early 2023, a new digital platform, uh, which will be bilingual, Estonian English, called Digital Livonia. And on this platform, we hope to make available quite a lot of different digitized materials. On the one hand, original sources, as I mentioned, but also digitized historical uh, source editions, mostly from 19th century and early 20th century, and make these sources, you know, searchable and, and, and analyzable as best as we can. Uh, but then also main products of the project will be different databases. So we are currently building different databases for instance, we try to have a, med a database on, on the clerics of medieval Livonia, a prosopographic database, all the names, states, every information we have about the clerics um, in, of the clergy in medieval Livonia. Then also we are uh, preparing a database on the members of Teutonic Order in Livonia. Then we have a major database about the inhabitants of medieval Tallinn. Because in Tallinn, we have this unique Tallinn city archives, a lot of information about the medieval inhabitants of Tallinn. And, and we hope to have this kind of prosopographic database. But then also we have a, a database on books in medieval Livonia. So we have information about all preserved books, but also books mentioned as secondary sources and books that only fragments are preserved. 
and so on and so forth. In total, we are building more than 10 different databases and hope that these databases will be important source or resource for all medievalists interested in the history of, of medieval Livonia. Well, that is such a wonderful resource to create and to be involved in. What an exciting project for you. But another project that I think is quite exciting for you is your upcoming book, The Fabric of Historical Time. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that. This project is a yeah, part of my interest in, in the theory of history and historiography. And, and this uh, it is co-written with a Hungarian colleague, Zoltan Poldizhan Simon. It's a short book for Cambridge University Press about the fabric of historical time in the sense that we try to provide new insights into this concept of historical time. And the key argument of the book is that we need to pluralize this concept in the sense of having this modernist idea of a single linear unified historical uh, time. We need a, a kind of idea of, of multiple historical times, so multiple historical temporalities. And, and uh, this is again, theoretically very challenging because all history research is based on this idea of, of linear. Uh, unified time. Uh, when we accept the idea that there is not one time, that many times in, in at the same time, that there is a plurality of times, then uh, what should we do as historians? Because historical research is, is very often by e explaining, by contextualization, by, by situating things in particular temporal or historical context. But if you argue that there is not one single temporal context, but many of different temporal contexts, then yeah, we are, we are faced uh, with different, you know, theoretical, conceptual, methodological issues. And so the, the book aims, yes, to cover these different issues and provide some insights how to overcome these, these challenges. Um, and, and of course the book is directly related to contemporary discussions about the technological and, and ecological changes. Um, at the time of the Anthropocene, we have to situate the human time in a much, you know, complex uh, set of times. And uh, we should probably give up this traditional distinction between natural time and historical time, natural history and human history. And also uh, we have to uh, cope with a much larger time scales. Normally, history is about you know a few uh, recent uh, thousands of years, but uh, maybe we should include also geological time and 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 explore different life forms uh, on the planet, not only human life, uh, and then also in terms of technology. I mean, the different new tools allow us to to understand the the, the you know. Uh, fundamental differences between the speed of time and, and uh, between nanoseconds still this large geological time. So we are, we are truly in, in, in redefining what time means for us. And I think it's also very important in the context of, of historical research. Yeah, certainly. And that is such a large concept to bring into, into just a few words. But can you speak a little bit more about this idea of like future-oriented history and, and how, how we can conceive of that? I believe that uh, one of the changes in our contemporary temporal orientation is the new meaning of the future. Because we have had, uh, again, uh, since last couple of centuries, very straightforward idea of future. It's like a promising land that we are moving toward a better future. And uh, the, the same linear concept of, of, of time that will end up in a, in a better future. But now I think uh, we are faced with different uh, future scenarios and some of them are very, you know, negative or even apocalyptic. We are worried about the extinction of species. We are worried about the climate change. We are worried about different, you know, major geological challenges uh, that humanity is currently facing. So the positive, the future is not so positive uh, anymore, at least for, for a certain number of people. And then on the other hand, we have a different technological future visions about singularity, about transhumanism, about you know joining uh, humans and and uh, artificial intelligence and and all kind of making human a multi-planetary species and and uh, 
Uh, so these are very challenging future scenarios, basically arguing that the humans, as we know them, will not exist in the future or in a very different shape as, as a kind of cyborgs or, or whatever. So my question is that when we are faced with this very, you know, uh, uh, different uh, futures, uh, what kind of impact it has on our notion of the past? Because I claim that that the concept of, of the past and the concept of future are very uh, closely connected, even intermingled. We cannot think about the past without thinking about of the future and vice versa. So when, uh, when our idea of the future is changing, I claim that also our idea of the past is changing, that the past depends on our idea of the future. And so I've, I've been kind of speculating in one of my recent articles about how the, the past would look like seen from the future. And, and um, that's why I, I make an argument, for instance, that we probably will have to develop kind of multi-species history, because when in the future, our relations with other forms of life will be very defined uh, for the sake of our, our survival. Uh, we cannot uh, remain the lords of this planet in the old way, because otherwise we might be, get extinguished. So, so we might want to reorient the focus of history and not have only the human history, anthropocentric history, but also history that includes other forms of life. And we could call it the multi-species uh, history. The question is whether only humans have history or whether also other forms of life have history. And if yes, why, why do not we study this history? But then on the other hand, just to give you a very few random examples, uh, when we believe that in the future, there will be some sort of cyborg organisms or that humans will, uh, you know, travel out to the space and, and conquer different planets like Mars or, or others, then maybe we should also start rethinking our past in terms of, of including uh, non-humans in our history, different, you know, machines and, and different tools that we have used so far. And also maybe we should, you know, expand our, our idea of history into multiplanetary history. Uh, why do we believe that history is only about life on the planet Earth? So these are very, you know, challenging, very speculative ideas. But I think it's very, you know, inspiring to think about this. And, 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 and this helps us to remind also that our understanding of history is, is very much dependent on, on our understanding of, of the future. Wow, so in the space of about 25 minutes, we have gone from medieval Livonia through the digitalization of, of cultural heritage all the way into the future and multiplanetary history and how that impacts our past. What a great span of research. Um, and I thank you for sharing it with us. Yeah, thank you for asking. Thank you. And, and yeah, hope to see you in real life on. Thank you for tuning in to Baltic Ways, a podcast from the Association for the Advancement of Baltic Studies, produced in partnership with the Baltic Initiative at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. I'm your host, Dr. Indre Ekmaris. To find out more about Dr. Tam's varied research, click on the link in our episode show notes. A reminder that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the policies or positions of AABS or FPRI. Subscribe to our newsletters at aabs-balticstudies.org and fpri.org slash baltic-initiative for more from the world of Baltic Studies. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.